So good morning, everyone. I'm Yao Qi. Uh, I, I'm more than happy to introduce our next speaker, uh, uh, Yao Qi Jia, who will be on the job market looking for either a academic or industry position uh, at the end of this, this year. So please uh, take a look at his interesting work here on an interesting class of vulnerabilities in Chrome sandboxing. OK, thanks for your introduction. <clears throat> so I'm Yao Qi Jia from National University of Singapore. Today, I'm going to present our recent work on, uh, of a security study of Chrome in the web local boundary. So this is a joint work together with Zhenglong, Hu Hong, Shuo Chen, Perdi, and Zheng Kai. So brothers used to be a monolithic piece of software. All the logic, including rendering HTML, executing JavaScript, and interacting with local systems are in the same precise. The problem of this design is that if there is a single bug in the browser, the web malicious web page can exploit the bug and take over the entire browser and further attack the underlying operating system. For example, the attacker can download malware, install it, and steal local files or data from different applications and software. To, to the extent, in 2006, researchers started to change the landscape. It broke through when browsers started to be designed using the ideas like privy separation and sandboxing. So this is so-called the second generation of web browsers, which adopt precise based isolation design. In this design, each website conceptually is uh, hosted in two processes. One is the render precise, which renders HTML and executes JavaScript. And the other one is the browser kernel, which interacts with the local system and uh, perform the, some lo um, local, uh, local um, operations. So this is good as the renderer has millions of lines of code. And, and if there is a bug inside, the bug is confined within the renderer precise, which prevents the exploit from directly accessing the local system. So this is what we call the web local boundary in the browser. So basically, websites cannot directly access the local system and uh, get the local data of the user. So many browsers like Chrome and uh, IE have already adopted this design. And Firefox starts to use this design also. The question we want to ask is that, is this web local boundary sufficient to prevent websites from directly accessing the local system? One thing I want to mention is that this actor has been through a lot of security testings. For example, this interface between the renderer and the browser kernel has under a lot of security testing and also the fuzzing testings. It is also involved in multiple bar bounty programs. So these APIs are strongly written and tested. If we get this interface right, then we can protect browser kernel and the local system from all the websites. So you may think this boundary is sufficient to isolate the web and the local system. However, in this work, I wish to dispel this myth. In fact, I'm going to show you that in today's landscape, the web local boundary is fuzzy. We don't know where it starts, and we don't even need to cross this specific boundary to access the local system. In current web, the boundary is no longer limited to the interface between the renderer and the browser kernel. It moves, it moves to a much larger surface. So our country contributions of this work are as follows. So first, we present concrete attacks to, um, to achieve goals such as accessing local files and obtaining the system control. For our attacks, we only use one bug in the renderer precise. And secondly, we uh, introduce several interesting techniques to bypass the in-memory protect, uh, protections in Chrome to achieve our goals. And lastly, we discuss the existing solutions, which are complete but may introduce non-negligible performance overhead. And we also propose our lightweight mitigation that may not complete but can be immediately implemented to mitigate our attacks. So in fact, we show that this problem is still open and we encourage researchers to pursue an effective and efficient uh, protection for Chrome and other browsers. 
So now let's revisit this web local boundary. The original idea of this web local boundary is that if a website wants to access the local system, it has to go through the interface provided by the browser kernel, as well as with the user's consent. However, in the current web, websites can access the local infrastructure via the cloud APIs and also the cloud software. So in fact, these cloud services have both the web interface, a well-designed website, and also a direct local interface, the client-side software. Therefore, even if, the broad, uh, even if in the browser there is a well-defined boundary, which is the interface between renderer and the browser kernel, but the real boundary between the website and the local system is no longer clear. And we can see this boundary is fuzzy. So now let's look at some concrete attack examples due to this fuzzy web local boundary. One of our attacks is that if there is a vulnerability in the render process, a malicious website can synchronize a malicious file into the victim's local system. You believe or not, if evil.com includes dropbox.com into an F frame, then they are sitting in the same process. But if you open dropbox.com in a separate type, they are in the different processes. This is a design of Chrome to reduce the performance cost by grouping sub-resources of one page into the same precise of that page. So given this, if there is no protection on the same origin policy, the evil.com can directly access dropbox.com in the iframe. Here is how the attack works. The evil.com first loads the Dropbox into an iframe, bypasses the SOP, injects malicious scripts, and then it can mimic a click on the save button. In this way, the site sends a request to the Dropbox cloud server, and then the client side software synchronizes with the cloud server and downloads the malware from the attacker's server to the victim's local system. Note that in this attack, the attacker never goes through the web, uh, web kernel interface, and this attack is directly via an indirect channel of the Dropbox cloud APIs. And one interesting finding is that after the synchronization, the attacker's uh, shared malware on the user local system still have the executable permission. This is, the, this is like the drive-by download, which is just one step left for the victim to install the malware. So the second example is similar to the first one. The basic idea is that the attacker can inject scripts into the Dropbox iframe and then share a uh, Share, uh, and then share the secret files with the attacker's account. By mimicking a click on the share button, the site sends a request to the cloud server, and the client side software uploads the secret file to the attacker's cloud. Then the attacker can read the content of the secret files. So based on the Dropbox APIs of the web interface, the attacker can further delete and update the local files in the shared folder. What I want to show you next is that this attack is not specific to Dropbox. As we have so many cloud services with various capabilities, the attacker can use these services to affect the local system. So different from the first two examples that only affect local files, the third attack can install malicious applications in the victim's uh, mobile device. Google Play, uh, Google Play provides such service that a user can log into the Google Play and then choose different applications to install. The Google Play's client-side software on the mobile then will download the same applications and install on the user's mobile device silently. So this feature can be used by the attacker. The attacker can load the Google Play into an iframe, redirect, a specific, uh, redirect to a specific page for the for malware, and then triggers an install button. The, with the help of Google Play server and the client side application, this malware will be silently installed on the victim mobile device without user's consent. So the last example is even more dangerous than the previous ones, which utilize the OpenStack service. OpenStack is a popular service for users to manage multiple virtual machines. It provides a convenient web interface for the user to directly send commands to the remote VMs. If a malicious site load, uh, sends commands like this one on behalf of the web interface, the commands will be delivered to the remote VM 
via the VNC uh, protocol, and finally be executed by the VM. The result we can see is that all data in the root directory are removed. So the four examples are just a tip of iceberg. Nowadays, the cloud services are numerous, and malicious websites can abuse these uh, cloud APIs to indirectly affect the local system. Well, in concept, we can see these attacks look straightforward. However, we are missing some very crit critical details of these attacks. That is, how to bypass the SOP enforcement. So, meanwhile, Chrome also applies other in-memory protections, making it more difficult to bypass SOP. The protections are control flow integrity, in-memory partitioning, and also the internal randomization. So the protection in this slide are Chrome specific, but we believe that all browsers that decide to include all sub resources or one page into the same process of that page, they have to implement some in-memory protections to protect against the memory exploits. So how does Chrome implement SOP? Well, a malicious website loads a benign site, say Dropbox, into an iframe and tries to access the iframe, it will encounter these SOP checks. Once the SOP checks pass, it can continue accessing. Otherwise, the access will be blocked. We analyzed the source code of Chromium and found that these SOP checks are determined by some security functions. For it, like this one, the can access function, which controls whether a site can access another iframe or not. Similarly, there are various SOP checks for cross-origin read, write, like content document and frames. So these checks are the hurdles for the attacker to bypass SOP. So is it possible to skip them? The first thing you may think is that uh, we can modify the control flow, like creating a new flow or modifying the existing one to skip these checks. However, Chrome can use CFI to prevent these code reuse attacks, which may alter the control flows. Then this approach does, does not seem to work. Well, if we cannot change the control flow, we may change the data flow. Based on our observations, we found that the SOP checks are determined by security functions like can access. If we look carefully, we can see that this function is influenced by decision, by decision making data called M universal access. When we set this flag as true, then this check always passes. And to make it general, we found lots of such decision making data or critical data. Once we craft such critical data, even without modifying any control flow, we can bypass SOP checks and finally bypass the SOP enforcement to access cross origin data. The next problem is, to, uh, is how to find this critical data. So if the vulnerable buffer and the critical data are sitting nearby, it is easy for the attacker to find the critical data. But that's not always true in Chrome. So Chrome has this in-memory partitioning mechanism. The intuition is to separate the easy overflow objects from the sensitive objects. For example, separating the general strings from the objects of the rendering class. The implementation of such partition is to separate different types of objects, which originally are together, then into four different partitions. Like all objects in the node class are partitioned into no partition, and all rendering related objects are separated into layout partition. Chrome also fills guard pages in between these partitions, and uh, then it seems like uh, the, the, it seems uh, that another hurdle to the attacker. But we have a solution again. So based on our observation, we found a lot of cross-partition references, which link objects in one partition to another. And these references are pervasive and uh, under the control of the scripts. In this way, the attacker can find various cross-partition pointers linking different partitions and dereference them to cross partition boundaries and find the target partition. Nevertheless, it's still not enough to achieve the attack. In addition to partitioning, Chrome also randomizes the base address of each partition. If a vulnerability in one partition tries to linearly scan the memory in another partition, 
it cannot predict uh, the uh, uh, address, uh, address. Once it encounters the guard page, the guard page will, lo um, will block the access and crash the program. Therefore, since the address of each partition is randomized, the attacker cannot predict the address of the critical data and also the vulnerable buffer. So how to tackle this challenge? Our answer is fingerprinting technique. The basic idea that we found most of the critical data have special patterns. The attacker can linearly scan the memory within the target partition to find this pattern. For example, the M universal access flag is within a class, and before this flag, there are several special objects like pointer to for protocol, host domain, and sub-origin. We dump the memory and can see that the host and the domain are the same, and the sub-origin is always zero. In this case, the attacker can first find this pattern and then calculate the offsite. Uh, offside to identify the M universal flag and set it as one to bypass these SOP checks. Uh, meanwhile, we can also use the same technique to find the base address of the vulnerable buffer. The idea is to first create a fingerprinting object with a special pattern like AAAA. Next, create, uh, create a bunch of pointers pointing to the fingerprinting object. After that, the attacker can linear scan the memory using the uh, vulnerable buffer. Uh, once found the pattern with 414141, it counts the offsight. Then the attacker can continue scanning and find the most frequent data, which is the address of the fingerprinting object. Therefore, the attacker can does, does a simple math, use the address of the fingerprinting object minus the offsight. Then it can get the base address of the vulnerable buffer. Thus, with the absolute address of a target critical data, the attacker can calculate the offside between the vulnerable buffer and the critical data, and further craft the data by citing the vulnerable buffer with the relative length. So these protections of Chrome seem very difficult for memory bug to bypass. However, we use data-oriented attacks to bypass the SOP and also the CFI. And we use these cross partition references to bypass the in-memory partitioning. And we also utilize the fingerprinting technique to bypass the internal ASLR. These techniques work on proper memory error vulnerabilities. We implemented the proof of concept based on a CVE bug in VA engine in Chrome 33. Meanwhile, we also use this bug to craft over 10 SOP related checks. And uh, they, also verify, uh, they are also verified in Chrome uh, 45 with debugger. Uh, we also uh, successfully conducted uh, the end-to-end -end attacks mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, accessing local files like Dropbox and also obtaining the remote control like OpenStack. So now we have learned the power of such web local attacks. So how to prevent such attacks? Next, I will show you from two perspectives. One is on the browser side, and the other is on the cloud service side. So on the browser side, we can use uh, complete memory safety for the browsers. This is holy grail. However, modern browsers have huge code base, like Chrome has over 5 million lines of code. So it is an open problem to guarantee the memory safety for such, uh, such huge code base. The second best solution is deploy SFI to create four domains for different uh, origins and iframes. Conceptually, this solution is feasible, but it's not clear whether this, can be so, uh, the, whether this can solve the problem or not. Since we have so many references linking different partitions or four domains, then the attacker may control some of them and bypass these boundaries. And uh, we have tried a lightweight mitigation to protect critical data used in our attacks. So we first identify the critical data for the SOP checks, and then randomize the address of this data to make them unpredictable. And we also save the address not in the user space, but in a dedicated uh, register. The average performance overhead is less than four per uh, person. You can check the details in our paper. Uh, since 
since our mitigation requires to identify the critical data first, which may not uh, be uh, complete, however, it is a best effort mitigation that uh, and uh, uh, resists part of the web local attacks. We sent this paper to Google, and uh, that led to an interesting conversation. They are trying to enforce the fine grand precise based isolation and have a project called auto precise iframes. The basic idea is to separate iframes into different processes. And both their team and our team agree that the performance overhead may be a hurdle. And the massive refactoring on the millions lines of code is another big hurdle. So this is approach is promising. Once they release the stable version, we will revisit this implementation to check whether the web local attack is still there or not. So on the other hand, on the broader uh, cross, uh, on the cloud service side, the cloud server can first uh, distinguish the request of its web interface from its client interface, and then restrict uh, the privileges of the web interface, like only allow it to read content but not write. Meanwhile, the client side software try, when the client side software uh, tries to synchronize files or perform sensitive operations, it should pop up warnings. Uh, pop up the warnings to the users and can continue executing only when with the user's consent. So in conclusion, in this work, we show that if the process based isolation disregards the same origin policy as one of its goal, then its promise of maintaining the web local boundary is doubtful. Further, we demonstrate that due to various cloud services, the landscape of current web has changed, and the web local boundary becomes fuzzy. So we propose, uh, propose uh, concrete attacks to cross such boundary to access local files and control systems. All these attacks only need one bug in the render process. And second, we show several techniques like data render attacks, cross partition references, and the fingerprinting technique to bypass the crumbs in memory protections, and further bypass the SOP enforcement. So our demo, uh, demo videos are online, and also the POC is available. For your convenience, you can check these links or directly scan the barcode. And uh, lastly, we discuss the existing solutions, which are, not, uh, which are complete, but performance overhead may be a hurdle. Meanwhile, there are still lack of efficient ways to protect the browsers against the web local attacks, which is still open to our researchers to work on. And uh, thanks for your attention. That's all of my talk, and the questions are welcome. Thank you very much, Yao Tu. We have a few minutes for questions. If anybody has some, please uh, state your name and your affiliation. Uh, Watson Ladd, UC Berkeley. Um, very, it's very impressive paper. I'm wondering, is it possible to see this issue as the process isolation is ignoring the same origin policy security boundary we want the browser to enforce. And therefore, even without the presence of the client and the connection to the local machines, you still have same origin violate policy violations which could let you, which would be significant. I see, so your question is, uh, even if we without these uh, native uh, application, uh, the, the client applications, whether by passing SOP enforcement still affect the whole system, right? Yeah, ignore the Dropbox and knowing my computer. You can still get all my email just by getting to Gmail. So uh, that is, uh, that is quite an interesting question. So, but, we, uh, but you can see that if we have these cloud services, we have much, uh, much power, right? We can directly access the local uh, system and local files. If you, uh, if you just bypass the SOP enforcement, basically just like uh, cross access different uh, websites data. So you can see the uh, serious level is quite different. All right, seeing as there's no more questions and lunch is right outside that door, let, let's thank the speaker one more time. Okay, thank you.